<laughs> Hi, zoology. Okay, so let's start our discussion for our second set of notes. So y'all still had some really, really great questions and I appreciate you guys. There were some questions that I had to research because I like knew but didn't really know. So let's get started. Okay, so the first question that I had was what are the lengths of time and the results of micro versus macro evolution? Um, so we actually know these terms, micro and macro evolution. So micro evolution, has to do with like natural selection. And it's those tiny adaptations that we see differences in different organisms over time. So microevolution we can actually see happen from one generation of organisms to the next generation of organisms or a couple of organisms or a couple of generations down. Um, in terms of macroevolution, this is big evolutionary changes that take hundreds of thousands of millions of years to happen. So this is when a species becomes so different through all those tiny micro adaptations that it actually divides or leaves the group genetically. They become so different, they become their own species. So that speciation, that's macro evolution. There's a lot of argument between whether, or well, there's not a lot of argument. Um, a lot of people, the vast majority of the world believe in microevolution because it's tiny little things that we see happen, but macroevolution for them is a lot more hard or a lot more difficult for them to grasp because it happens on such a large scale that we're not able to see. The second question, and I'm this one I, I had to look up because I didn't know. Um, I knew that there were some, but I didn't know any specifics. Are there any recent events of speciation? And the answer is yes. So actually recently we found that um, in plants, there has been a bunch of different species created, but that's because plants reproduce so much faster. And um, there's also different um, flies that are speciations that they devolved, divided and were creating new species. And finally, what I researched and found out last night is there's new species of orca whales. I didn't even know that there were separate species of orca whales, but they have created different species because of the way that they've been divided. So there was a land mass in between two different sets of orca populations. And because they were separated, they weren't able to uh, trade genes and that created two different subspecies in different areas. So that was really cool. I thought that was interesting and something I didn't know. Um, next question. What's the uh, advantage of being a protostome or a deuterostome? And this one I actually have to type out um, to let you know. So the reason that we have the differences between protostomes and deuterostomes is the determinant versus indeterminate determinant cells. So protostomes are what we call determinant cells. So when their cells are dividing, all of their cells are assigned to a specific job. So they're assigned to be a heart cell, they're assigned to be a muscle cell, they're assigned to be bone cells, a brain cell. Whereas a deuterostome, they have no determined this is what you're going to be. They all start out as just like individual stem cells and then once it gets further into development that's when they assign their position. The benefit to this is when we're indeterminate if we lose a cell during that cell division like one of them dies that creature or any of the other cells around it can take its place as that role. However, in a protostome, if one of those cells dies and it was a brain cell, that brain is no longer going to function. So losing cells in a protostome organism could result in death. So that's why it pays to be a deuterostome. Um, and another one of the questions were how many deuterostomes are there? So deuterostomes only make up 1% of the animal population in total. So very small amount. Uh, how do organisms with no organs survive? The fact is they rely solely on uh, diffusion or tissues and other cells to perform those functions that organs would do. 
uh, the first two organisms or the first two organism groups that we're going to talk about rely solely on um, diffusion and cell groups. So they don't have organs. All right, we're almost done. Got like three more questions. Question number five, where did whales come from? So <laughs> whales evolved from this, this organism. I'm going to show you a picture real quick because I have it at the end. This organism called the Ambulocetus. It is a four-legged creature that the face of it kind of looks like a possum and it had whiskers and everything. Like it's kind of creepy. It lived on both land and water, but over time, some of the Ambulocetus, Ambulocetus organisms just stayed in water and eventually evolved to no longer need the use of their back legs since they were in water and developed large front flippers. Um, this came from that evolutionary process because it's not random. It is definitely tuned in to what that organism needs or what genes are going to pass on. So when we think about natural selection, natural selection is just um, whichever organism can survive and pass on those genes. So if we think about the Arctic tundra and we have brown rabbits and white rabbits, the white rabbits will survive because they blend into the background. So those brown rabbits will die out. But if those same rabbits were in a forest, the white rabbit's gonna be easy to show up. So they're not gonna live long enough to pass their traits on. Uh, number seven, what sparked Darwin's idea for evolution? So he was a natural history student uh, in university. So he was already tuned into describing, observing the natural processes around him. He collected bugs, uh, some beetles and butterflies, and was able to see the differences between all the different species. And when he went on his adventure on the beetle to the Galapagos Islands, he was then able to distinguish some specific adaptations with finches and their beaks and what they eat, and with tortoises and the next size that they had compared to what they ate as well. So different adaptations, that's where he started. And then he wrote his book about it when he went back to England. Um, Wallace also wrote a book on natural selection as well. And so that was, and eventually he came to the idea that all organisms start with a common ancestor. The origin of life is what he, he described it as. And there's a big tree that he drew with them. There was a specific beginning or organism that started off life. And then from there off, we just branched off different ideas. Um, this, I want you guys to write down regardless of whether you wrote down anything from what I've just talked about, but evolution. So there's some problems with people believing that um, evolution replaces an organism that it came from. Like we came, humans came from chimps. So why are there still chimps if humans evolved from them? That's not how it works. <laughs> It's not one replaces the other. It's now we have just two separate groups where this group is now meeting a new need with new evolutionary traits. The old group is still there, probably going through evolution and getting new evolutionary traits based on their environment that they're exposed to as well. So that is our evolution um, discussion. And I hope you guys learned a lot and I'll see you guys again real soon. Bye. Woo, I did it.